Welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. You can find the club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. I'm Gloria Duffy, President and CEO of the Commonwealth Club, and I welcome you to tonight's town hall meeting on North Korea's recent behavior and the security situation on the Korean Peninsula. Kim Jong-un, the 30-ish leader of North Korea, has made a number of bellicose statements over the past few weeks, which when combined with steady movement by North Korea towards a nuclear weapons capability, has caused alarm in South Korea, in the US, in China, in Japan, and around the world. You've seen Mr. Kim's statements reported in the media, as well as the coverage of North Korea's nuclear weapons and ballistic missile tests. Tonight, we're going to look behind those headlines at what's happening on the North Korean Peninsula, on the Korean Peninsula. How concerned should we be? What steps should leaders in South Korea, in the US, China, Japan, what steps should international organizations be taking to deal with this situation? Joining me to discuss the most recent military and political developments, I'm very pleased to welcome two colleagues who are terrific experts on the Korean Peninsula. To my far right, David Straub is Associate Director of Stanford University's Korean Studies Program at the Walter H. Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center. He spent 30 years as a US Foreign Service officer focused on Northeast Asia, including a dozen years working on Korean affairs. He played a key role in the six-party talks on North Korea's nuclear program as the State Department's Korea Country Desk Director, and he also served eight years at the US Embassy in Japan. To my immediate right, Philip Yun is the Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of Plowshares Fund, a foundation that supports efforts to reduce the threat of nuclear war and of the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Previously, he was a vice president at the Asia Foundation, also a Pantech scholar at Stanford University, and while there, he co-edited a book entitled North Korea, 2005 and Beyond. Philip has had many roles in the past, including as vice president of H&Q Asia Pacific, a private equity firm, he was uh, served in the State Department during the Clinton administration, working on many Northeast Asian political, economic, and security issues. He was a senior member of the US delegation at several high-level US negotiations with North Korea. He accompanied Secretary of State Madeleine Albright to Korea, as well as several other visits. He's a graduate of Brown University, Columbia University Law School, and he was a Fulbright Scholar in Korea. Most of you know that I am a former US Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, handling issues of reducing and preventing the <coughs> proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, although in the former Soviet Union, not in Korea. I authored, co-authored a textbook on arms negotiations, and I hold a doctorate from Columbia University. I work with Mr. Yun as a board member at Plowshares Fund, and with colleagues at Stanford as an advisory board member at the Freeman Spogli Institute of International Studies. Thank you, Phil and David, for being with us this evening. Tonight's program is a town hall meeting, and the format for these kinds of programs at the Commonwealth Club is more interactive and less formal than some of our other programs. There will be no speeches. I will start off with a couple of questions to my fellow panelists to get us going. Then it's up to you in the audience to jump in with your questions, and I'm sure there are many questions on your minds after the events of the last uh, few weeks. Please use the mics that are in the aisles so your comments will be captured for the recorded radio broadcast. If you're not on those mics, folks out in radio land will not be able to hear you. You may also send up your written questions on the question cards that have been provided on your seats, and the um, ushers also have more question cards if you need them. Uh, I'll then pose those questions, or as many as we can fit in, to the panelists. I will take questions myself if you want to put them to me. And since we have a number of knowledgeable individuals in the audience, including I see Japanese Consul General Inomata here in the front row, I may ask also ask some of you to address questions that come up according to your own expertise. So let me start us off with this question. Who is the source of these provocative statements and actions within 
the North Korean leadership. Could you please say something about the North Korean leadership that would help us to understand both the verbal threats and the progression towards nuclear weapons? There is a young leader, but he also has a powerful uncle, a regent of sorts. There are powerful military leaders. Who is speaking for North Korea? Gentlemen? Well, that's the $64 million question. <laughs> we really don't ha have a very good understanding of who is in charge and who does what in North Korea. Uh, we do have a lot more knowledge about North Korea than we used to because we've been dealing with them diplomatically for 20 years. Uh, so we can infer a lot, but it's very difficult to be certain about what the North Koreans are thinking concretely and in detail at any real, in real time. And that's the real challenge that, that we have today. Uh, I myself think that much of North Korean uh, behavior can be explained in terms of their reaction to a kind of desperate situation. Fundamentally, the Korean Peninsula is divided into two Korean states, each of which re regards itself as the only legitimate state, and they're both competing for the hearts and minds of the Korean people over the long term. Now, they wouldn't necessarily be doing that if they had two similar systems ideologically and economically, and if both systems were fairly successful, then they could negotiate equally. But North Korea has failed miserably, and they feel quite desperate. And the way they respond is not by negotiating from their existing stance of weakness, but to puff up and to exaggerate their power and their determination to get their way. Mr. Yen. I think that, just as a disclaimer, um, because uh, this past week has been full of a lot of discussion related to North Korea by a number of, of uh, columnists including and, and uh, uh, talking heads, including myself, one of the things I want people to remember, when it comes to le internal leadership dynamics, I don't think really anyone knows exactly what is going on. I think all of it is really pure speculation. Some of it is informed speculation to some degree, but it is nonetheless, nonetheless speculation. As David said, we do know a lot about certain kinds of dynamics. We know a lot about some of their economics. We know a lot about their negotiating behavior. But in terms of who's doing what, when, where, and how, no one really has a clue. Uh, that being said, I think what we have to really look at is behavior. Apart from rhetoric, I think that speculating about who's in charge is, is useful up to a certain point. But if that takes precedent over sort of figuring out what, how to deal with a particular problem, uh, then we, 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 we sort of lose sight of what the, what the real issue is. And what we see right now is regardless of who's in charge, the bottom line is that the North Korean government has continued to use the same policies that it has in the past. It has used threats, intimidation, blackmail, in violation of international law to try to get certain things that it wants. And that kind of behavior has not changed. And that is something that, I mean, that's, that's the only thing that we ultimately can act on. And I think David has alluded to a number of reasons why the North Koreans act as they are. They are very good at uh, getting a lot with not much. They, they've been very successful in that way. And, but one of the things that I want people to understand and one of the, the things that I sort of take, my mother was, uh, was from North Korea. I have a whole family who are who are, who are from the, what is now North Korea and my, my, my uh, family uh, father's from the South. One of the things that I took away from, from, from North Koreans in certain ways, and I'll generalize, is that it's very difficult to give in. And what I've noticed many times is when you tap, someone, you tap someone once, they will tap you back twice. And I think that's very instructive, particularly when you're very weak and all you have is bluster. There's this notion that if you let someone take advantage of you and you show weakness, that'll be the rest, that, that will be how it will be for the rest of the time that you're in existence. So this is something that I think very much is something that we have to consider as we move forward on this. Just to press on this leadership question a tiny bit more, so there is a group of generals, there are some older family members, there's the young Kim Jong-un. Is there any chance that they're not all on the same page here, or would they have to be all coordinating and on the same page 
to have the kinds of statements and policies that have been made? Well, I, I think that it's, it's not really clear at this point. I don't think it's, that's necessarily the case. I think that we see there are some indicators that Kim Jong-un, to a certain degree, has consolidated power. When Kim Jong-il died, he had seven people who, there were seven people who accompanied him, his cough and his body. Out of those seven people, six of them are no longer in positions of power. They've been replaced by people that Kim Jong-un finds who are his confidants. The only one who is there is, his, is basically his uncle-in-law, uh, Jang sung tae So that kind of tells you that there is a consolidation piece that is actually going on. One of the things that I, again, try to take back with when I'm thinking about North Korea is that it is not a monolith. There, in a, even in a dictatorship, there is not a monolith, particularly in, in a third generation dictatorship. I think it was very clear with Kim Jong-un, there were competing factions that he had to deal with. He had to placate, he had to satisfy the military, there was the party, uh, there were uh, people who had, in his father's, his father's Kim Il-sung, the founder of North Korea's generation, I think in the very same way at this early stage, particularly when the, the, transfer, the, uh, the changeover um, was not probably as well planned or took as long as, he, as Kim Jong-il wanted to, there are going to be some factions uh, some extra work that needs to be done. So I think the short of it is, is that consolidation is happening, but he has to make sure that there, there are vested interests that he has to pay attention to. So why now? It seems like there's been a ratcheting up of uh, the rhetoric by North Korea and of course more troubling nuclear weapons and, and missile tests. Why now is the situation simply a degree more desperate for them than it has been? How do you explain the higher level of uh, rhetoric? I think there's a domestic political explanation and a strategic explanation. In domestic political terms in North Korea, there's the, the new leader and the people around him have to bolster their position. And one of the ways they can do that is by showing that they're tough, decisive leaders and by sort of exaggerating and even manufacturing an external threat. Uh, strategically, North Korea, I think, for a long time, has aimed to become a nuclear weapon state for, for a number of reasons we can go into later. Um, and they are now at the point at which they are close to having uh, a nuclear weapons capability deliverable by missiles. So this is a very tense and precarious moment. And so I think a lot of their bluster is a smokescreen to allow them to actually get by with the continued development of their nuclear and missile programs. I think there's one other element. I think David is absolutely right on. He talked about a domestic component, a strategic military component. I think there's sort of an international relations component as well. I think historically North Korea has shown that it has used this kind of rhetoric and bluster to extract benefits from the international community, food, fuel. Uh, I think to some degree they do want recognition to being a nuclear weapon state, so that's part of it. I also think there's a new wrinkle here, a different wrinkle here that, that, is, that is unique. I, I think a lot of uh, experts or people who follow North Korea were thinking that 2013 would be an interesting year, that 2012 not a lot was going to happen because there was so much changeover in governments that were happening in China, Japan, South Korea, and in the United States. We didn't know who our leadership was going to be, so therefore policy was sort of on standby. And so the feeling was, was that in 2013, when all these governments cut into place, that there would be some initiative related to North Korea. Well, the interesting thing happened is that North Korea realized that too. And they said, well, why should we wait until all these people get their governments in place, they talk to each other and have a consolidated plan for us? We don't want this. Let's take advantage of what's going on. We want to test. We want to do these things to advance our our, K, our uh, capability militarily. So let's take advantage of these new governments coming into place, not knowing exactly what the policy is going to be, and try to move as quickly as we possibly can. So looking back at this, what we have here, in a sense, is a third test. We had the missile test, uh, which was in December. We had in February the nuclear test. And the third test that's happening right now is a test of the international community. It's a test of the resolve and the temperaments of, our, of the governments and the United States in particular about what we are going to do in a certain case where there is ratchet of pressure um, that is constantly moving. So they are probing us. And I think this is another reason for why they're doing what they're doing. 
Everyone, feel free to go to the mics. I have some uh, written questions here, but you're welcome to ask questions verbally. So the New York Times uh, covered uh, in today's paper uh, a policy by the US and allied countries, which in this case may include China, to have a carefully modulated, very cautious policy on response to North Korea, to not trigger, not overreact, not trigger any, anything uh, you know, dangerous. What Did you read about this policy and what do you think of it? Is this the right way to respond? In other words, if North Korea does a certain thing, then the response will be X and it's all planned out in advance. Yes, it's, it's an important article and I commend it to all of you. Uh, I think you're referring to the report about uh, the United States and South Korea having now reached a, an agreement uh, on how to respond if North Korea once again attacks South Korea as it did twice in 2010, killing 50 people. And after those attacks, the South Korean uh, government and many of its people basically said, we've had enough. Uh, there have been so many attacks, acts of war conducted against South Korea over the past 70 years that they said, we're not going to put up with this. The more we put up with this, the worse it gets. And the next time North Korea attacks us like this, we will retaliate. Now, South Korea has never retaliated for such an attack. Moreover, they said, not only will we retaliate, but we will attack not only those who attacked us, we will attack those who commanded them, even some of those possibly in Pyongyang. And that caused a great deal of concern, frankly, within Washington that uh, such a scenario could result in an escalation uh, possibly leading to, to full-scale war on the Korean Peninsula. So this latest report sourced to senior U.S. officials is that the U.S. and South Korea have reached an agreement. They will uh, jointly respond to further North Korean attacks on South Korea. They will uh, uh, retaliate. Uh, it could be not necessarily the place that attacked them, but a similar target. But they would not attack, presumably, or the way it sounded, the commanding authority or certainly Pyongyang. And there was a reference in there to U.S.-South Korean consultation. In other words, the U.S. put its foot down and said, we're an ally. If there's war on the peninsula, we'll be in it with you, but we don't want you doing things completely on your own that may lead to war. So before you retaliate, you will consult with us. So that's the, the history of that particular aspect of the report. Uh, sort of stepping back for the audience here, let, I, I think we should be very, very clear. I think that the chances of North Korea conducting a preemptive nuclear attack on the United States is, is virtually non-existent um, at this point with a long, with a long range missile. Uh, they don't have the capability to do that. And quite frankly, I'm not sure that this is what uh, this is not what folks uh, uh, in Washington are really worried about, if I had to, to guess about that. I think what we should be more concerned about is this notion of miscalculation, uh, which David alluded to. Uh, North Korea, there's a history of attacks and, and, and firefights that happened between North and South Korea. And a incident maybe two years ago, which would have been relatively minor, has the capacity under this sort of circumstance to really be quite uh, a, spin out of control, and that's something we have to, to really be worried about. I thought the article in the New York Times was good. It also made me feel like, okay, they're doing what they should be doing, and I'm not surprised about that. Because miscalculation is the big thing here, we have to make sure that each escalation and, that, and the, the response to that is proportionate and not too overly provocative. But at the same time, as I said before, we have to be very firm because they are testing us. And so what we hear here is a sort of phased in approach of how to respond to every single move that North Korea does. And North Korea is what we call slicing the salami. They're turning on the pressure slowly but surely, whether it's uh, blocking workers at Kaesong, that, that facility that's between North and South Korea, that, that's a joint South Korea uh, business uh, effort to then suspending who knows what next will happen. These are very small things that are happening right now. And the United States is saying, OK, we're going to respond to this appropriately. But the good thing, I think, and what I disagreed with the reporting, is that there was a discussion that the, that the administration probably didn't think this through, that perhaps they responded too heavily with the B-52s uh, bombers and the uh, stealth fighters. 
I am a little skeptical about that because when we were both in government, the first thing you asked is, okay, what happens is, is if this thing gets to be too hot, what is the off-ramp for this? How can we start moving down? And for them, and these, this reporting seemed to, seemed to intimate that uh, the North Koreans caught the administration off guard, and quite frankly, I, I, I'm quite skeptical of that. Gentleman here at the mic. Yeah, I think what, what's on my mind and probably what's on a lot of people's mind is the worst case scenario. Either it's a miscalculation or not a miscalculation. There, there's war out there and, and, and Seoul is right on the border. Um, can they attack Seoul with a nuclear weapon? Or, can, or, or if not conventionally, and what will we do about it? Thank you. And, the, <clears throat> the irony is that North Korea has had the capacity basically to destroy the capital city of Seoul, which has about 40% of the, of the population and most of the major uh, resources of the country ever since the end of the Korean War. The North Koreans have thousands of artillery tubes just across the DMZ, just north of, of Seoul. So they really did not need a nuclear, they don't need a nuclear weapons capability as a deterrent. They have deterred both the United States and South Korea ever since the Korean War because of the risk to Seoul. So uh, I don't, they have presumed, apparently very few nuclear devices. We, uh, we, as far as we know, none are, are yet able to be put on missiles. So for now the concern is that uh, the North Koreans in an all out war could, would use their artillery and destroy a good part of Seoul. Yeah, I think that, again, the, the issue here is really conventional, uh, artil conventional military means. That's what we have to be most concerned about. I think what I'm concerned about, again, in terms of miscalculation, is I, I'm somewhat worried that the North Koreans feel like that they have, the, they have more control over the situation than, 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 uh, than they actually do. I think what's happening here for their, from, from their standpoint is they're responsible for this ratcheted up tension. This is something that they do all the time, and I feel like they, they, they think they have a faucet here where they can turn it on and they can turn it off, and if things get too hot, they can start dialing it back down again. That may or may not be the case, and again, this is where we have room for miscalculation. Kim Jong-un is relatively new. His leadership folks are new. The North Koreans specialize in, in what I call pushing the envelope, the edge of the envelope, but the problem right here is I don't know if they know where the edge of that envelope is at this point, and this is where we can get into some some, some difficulties. <clears throat> What's also of concern is not where they are today <clears throat> with the nuclear weapons capability, but where they'll be in two to three years. Because I think that probably is the time horizon based on both their weapons tests and their missile tests at which they could possibly start deploying an, act, an, an operational nuclear weapons capability. Maybe not capable of hitting the US, but capable of going some distance. So if that, do you agree that that's what's in the offing here? Well, two years ago, then Secretary of Defense Bill Gates predicted that within five years, the North Koreans would in fact be able to threaten the U.S. homeland with, with nuclear uh, we're right on, warheads. We're right on track. Well, uh, we, we could be. Uh, I don't know, I'm not a nuclear or missile expert, but I do follow the experts very closely. And, and I have watched the North Koreans off and on for, for 30 years, and I think it would be a mistake to underestimate them. I think they have proven that uh, you know, they're not the first to do this. All they have to do is copy, uh, which is not easy, but they've proven that they can do this, and they're determined enough to do it. They're smart people, and uh, I think on the current trajectory, so to speak, they will eventually achieve a, a, a limited nuclear capability. And uh, if they continue to threaten um, and, and act and talk the way they are now, when they actually have a deliverable nuclear capability, I myself wonder how the top leadership in the US and other countries, uh, what they will think about that and what they will decide to do. I don't know, but I worry about the future. So that's, that's the difficulty of all this, uh, not to underestimate, which we constantly do, and not to overestimate, which we constantly do, and to try to make sure that we sort of are an even keel. Just to give you some perspective, I mean, I completely agree that the short end of this range is two, three, four, five years. But again, if you talk about this, I think it was in the late 1990s, uh, 
Donald Rumsfeld headed a blue ribbon commission that talked about how North Korea would have an intercontinental ICBM, I believe it is, uh, within five years if it decided it wanted to do so. And we know they clearly wanted to do so, but that hasn't happened. I mean, we, for them to get that capability, the United States it took 24 tests. We had nine failures for a similar Atlas rocket, uh, liquid fuel. They've had five tests, one success. So again, it, there is a range here, and it's really then trying to figure out the, the policymakers you know, it's their judgments, and that's what we, what they get paid for in terms of making those those decisions. I think that the big picture, though, Gloria, is you're absolutely right. My fear is that we are going to get through this whole crisis. We're going to breathe a sigh of relief, and we're going to forget the big picture is what David is talking about. That North Korea ultimately wants to have a small nuclear arsenal that has a delivery capability, and we've really made no progress. Uh, from our perspective, from the United States perspective, on trying to figure out a way to roll that back. And so what will have happened is that North Korea then has had a nuclear test, uh, a missile test, uh, maybe another set of tests, and, and they're basically in the same situation that they were one year ago. And we're just breathing a sigh of relief because we got out of this crisis. So that's the one thing I think why I want everyone to keep, uh, keep uh, focused on, that it's really the longer term and the medium term of what we really need to be concerned about. We will come back to this question during our session tonight. Sir? Yes. Uh, if push came, push came to shove and it escalated into a military conflict, what do you think China would do? Uh, <laughs> I, wish, I wish there was someone from the, from the Chinese council. Anyone here. here who wants to take that question? It, 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 it all depends upon the circumstances. Upon the circumstances. Yeah. It's an excellent question. If, uh, for example, if North Korea in a clearly unprovoked way launches a major attack on Seoul and U.S. and South Korea respond militarily, I don't think China will, will rush to, to North Korea's defense. If, on the other hand, the United States, for example, decides in a year or two that we have to take uh, preemptive action against the nuclear and missile facilities of North Korea, uh, and North Korea responds badly, I can imagine China being more supportive of the North Koreans. It, it very much depends on the situation. The Chinese do not, they want to support the status quo. They'd prefer North Korea not have nuclear weapons, but they want to see a uh, non-American ally remain in charge in Pyongyang. And they're concerned uh, that if they don't support Pyongyang, that that regime will, will collapse or, or eventually will have to unify with the South and that all of unified Korea then would be a U.S. ally. Uh, and the Chinese simply don't want that. But they, they also don't want to see a terrible war on the Korean Peninsula either. So it's a very, the, the Chinese like us have a lot of things to consider when it comes to dealing with the Korean Peninsula. You can bet there's a lot of hand-wringing going on in, in China right now. And what you have is a, a, a discussion like I have not seen in quite some time about what they need to do about North Korea. I think to some degree people are saying we have this lead, we, we, we are tied to this albatross, how do we get out of it in certain respects. I think that there is the senior leadership, which is quite traditional, feels that they were they fought for North Korea and, and, and had so many casualties to keep North Korea basically from becoming, uh, for, to, to main, maintain their buffer state status. For them to give that up and to change that um, is very difficult for them. On the other hand, you have the younger generation of scholars who are saying, why are we doing this? Why is China continuing to attach itself to a loser, in a sense? And this is not helping us in the long run, and we've got to do something about it. So it'll be very interesting to see what transpires over the next, you know, next six months with this particular crisis, but over the next few years in China with respect to North Korea. But, but by the way, if I could add one thing. By the way, I, I myself am skeptical that the Chinese are going to drop the North Koreans anytime soon. Of course, we have to wait and see how the North Koreans behave in coming years. But you may have all seen over the weekend there were these reports in the media that China uh, issued, uh, the new leader, Xi Jinping, issued a clear warning to North Korea 
criticizing countries that would uh, upset uh, peace and stability in the region. Well, I, it's clearly not cl clear cut like that. It, uh, th it looked to me as if the Chinese were being as critical of the United States in this respect as they were of North Korea. I, I agree with David. I don't foresee any change, uh, substantive change in, in China's policy for over the short term. And I think that there is a myth out there that, that, I, that a lot of people thought that China, North Korea was China's problem to solve. And that was something that I think people during the last 10 years were hoping that was going to be the case. In fact, it's not the case. I think uh, China, and we've heard reports from various people in, in government talking about how China is the key. I agree, China is, is, is necessary. For us to solve this problem, we're having hope of solving it, China has to be intimately involved, but they cannot solve it by themselves. And if we do think they can solve it by themselves, we're gonna be in the same situation that we've been for the last five or six years. There are a lot of very specific questions here. Uh, one had to do with uh, what is going to happen to the 500 South Korean workers in the uh, Kaesan managers stuck in Kaesan industrial zone, will they be able to return to South Korea safely? If they don't, what will be the consequences? At this point, uh, we, we, we have no idea. There's no indication that they're being held hostage, I would say. They are staying there by their own volition at, at this point. That is potentially one way for North Korea to escalate uh, uh, and to put more pressure. I, I'm a little skeptical at this point uh, for them, that they would do something like that unless we did something that sort of merited that at this, uh, merited that kind of response. I think initially the North Koreans thought that the Kaesong thing and, and blocking it and, and doing what they are doing right now was a winner for them in the sense that there are people who looked at that as a symbol of, of cooperation between North and South Korea, and the North Koreans were possibly betting that there were elements in South Korea that would blame the United States for this shutting itself down. Uh, people were also saying there's no way the North Koreans are going to be doing this because it's a source of hard currency. I think in the end, uh, this, the, the way this is working out is all to the uh, to the detriment of North Korea. In fact, what it is doing is creating an incredible amount of bad will in South Korea, among South Koreans, of what's happening there. And I think that from purely a business perspective, if this continues for very much longer, uh, Kaesong was shut down, I think, three times in 2009, the longest it was for three days. If it continues for very much longer, you've got South Korean businesses that I think invested close to a billion dollars in putting that up. And business runs on certain kind, on certainty and being able to make deliveries. And so they had these companies and investors made a big bet on this and put a lot of their prestige and money on the line. And in fact, what's going to happen related to this is that they're, they're going to get nothing for it. And so this will then come back, I think, to uh, that North Korea will regret doing this in, in the way they have. And it will be really difficult to restart that kind of thing uh, unless there's a lot more effort put into it. So th this is why I'm really uh, sad about this particular development. Is there someone over on this side? Ma'am? Yes, um, my question has dovetailed so many times. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I just wanna go back, way back to where I'm lacking finesse totally. And I'm thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, somebody attacks England or Germany or France and they're our enemy. So we attack them. They're our ally. So isn't South Korea like that? So we have to go to war with them? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Uh, <clears throat> if North Korea attacks South Korea, the U.S. is a treaty ally of South Korea, yeah. uh, we will join with South Korea, there's no doubt, and we will uh, uh, fight back against the North Koreans. Oh. Um, to that extent, um, in a kind of different way, economically, what kind of leverage do we have on them? Um, I think we've got all the sanctions we can have on them, right? So what good is that doing? Uh, that's one of the key questions. How much leverage? Right. Where, where is our leverage right. against North Korea? Um, we have, as you say, uh, put on a tremendous number of sanctions against North Korea. Basically, since the Korean War broke out, um, we, we can still find more. 
Uh, the problem is getting uh, other countries, especially China, to agree and to actually implement uh, such sanctions. And, and China, for the reasons we've already discussed, is reluctant to, to put that many sanctions on North Korea. We have other uh, leverage against North Korea in terms of uh, mobilizing the support of our friends and partners in the international community. Uh, having our diplomats at the United Nations and other places uh, uh, condemn the way North Korea treats its people, its illegal pursuit of nuclear weapons and things like that. Uh, we, we use military resources to try to manage uh, the risk on the Korean Peninsula to try to deter North Korea. Um, there are other ways that we can try to leverage them. But the difficulty is that Ultimately, we probably don't have enough leverage to make North Korea actually give up nuclear weapons anytime soon. Uh, so we're stuck now for some time, I think, with managing and trying to reduce the North Korean th threat rather than necessarily getting exactly what we want. I mean, there's so many things. It feels like it's such a passive aggressive. They're kind of like bidding us into it and saying, hey, it's your fault. I'm trying to blame us for going into something that they called us into. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. So let's go on to the next question. Uh, just building on that, though, it, you are saying that you think we will have a nuclear-armed North Korea, that that's simply a fact. Much as with Pakistan and uh, other countries, we've had to accept that mm -hmm. and deal with the country. Uh, um, I believe it is probable that uh, North Korea will continue to work on its nuclear and missile programs uh, and will continue to develop those and, and will probably have a small uh, deployable nuclear weapons capability in the coming years or, or at, at the latest the coming decade or two. Um, by, I think, by the way, I agree with you about that. I think that is a very bad thing. I think it's not the end of the world. I think it is manageable. Uh, the key word here is accept. Sh will the United States, should the United States and the international community accept North Korea having a nuclear weapons capability? No, absolutely not. So what does that mean? It means we will not have normal diplomatic relations with North Korea. Not that we won't talk with them, but that we won't have normal diplomatic relations. It means that we won't ease the sanctions. We'll increase the sanctions. It means we will continue to make it clear that we are willing to negotiate, reach a, a fair deal with North Korea to end its nuclear weapons program, but we will never normalize relations and ease the pressure on them until they actually give up those nuclear weapons. Now, the North Koreans do not believe we will hold to that. That's what the US government position is today. The North Koreans, for years now, have been privately telling private American citizens and US officials that they intend to have a nuclear weapons capability to be a nuclear weapons state. Um, and they say, but look at Israel. Look at India. Look at Pakistan. You deal with them. Why can't you deal with us? All we want is just a few, just to deter you. Of course, they don't understand that North Korea and the Korean Peninsula is not Israel. It's not India. It's not Pakistan. And the US, I'm firmly convinced, no US president will ever change that position. But I'm just as firmly convinced that for now, the North Koreans don't believe that we will hold to that position. And that's a problem. So let me answer the question this way. I think that if the status quo continues in terms of the policies that are being, uh, that, that are being implemented um, by the international community, I think that what we're talking about will, will happen. I do think that, there, that North Korea will eventually become, have a, nucle a small nuclear arsenal and a means to deliver them. I think, however, there is, it depends on what kind of time frame we're talking about and what time horizon. I think that for right now, or the short term, there is no way, and I short term North Korea is ever is willing to give up its nuclear weapons. Uh, I think that there was a question about that 15 years ago when they didn't have them and they were willing to give up something they didn't have. Now it's a completely different circumstance. But I do think that there is a, a middle way here where you can sort of contain and limit the, the number that it gets to a certain point and with intensive diplomatic action and engagement 
a, a, a form of engagement, smart engagement, I guess would be the way to, to do it, combination of carrots and sticks, that there is a way for North Korea to eventually look at its interests differently that may make a rollback of some kind possible. Uh, that's why, in a sense, we're involved in the, in the business that we're involved in, uh, because I think we see that there is always hope to some degree and that there is, it's worth the effort to move forward. I, I think, again, over the short term, it's going to be very difficult to do, if not impossible, but I do think that over the medium and longer term that that, that, that path is there. But it's not going to be easy, and the more time we continue to do what we're doing right now, that path gets harder and harder to, 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 to get through. For our radio, television, and internet viewers and listeners, this is the broadcast of the Commonwealth Club of California, and we're having a town hall meeting about the security situation on the Korean Peninsula. So the United States and South Korea and Japan and Australia have developed sea-based anti-missile systems that are capable of attacking ballistic missiles uh, after they have been launched, but before they have hit their targets. Uh, they're based on a variety of platforms, types of ships, destroyers, cruisers. The system is called Aegis, A-E-G-I-S. Those are the ships that I know about that have been very appropriately sent to that area. That is one of the best approaches to dealing with any possible threat of attack with using missiles from North Korea, which is to stop them before they would reach their targets. So um, this is, these are not ships carrying troops that are with a plan to go to war on or defend South Korea, as far as I know. They are the Aegis destroyers uh, to try to neutralize any threat of a North Korean missile attack. Others may yes, want to the, the U.S. government has announced that uh, that such anti-missile defense systems are being deployed uh, to use if it appears that a North Korean missile would attack would would actually land on the territory of the United States or one of our allies. So I think I myself, if North Korean missiles were being launched, would probably prefer very much to be on one of those ships. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's talk for a moment about inside North Korea. Please share your thoughts on whether or how the domestic human rights situation has changed under the new leadership. And this writer asks, the degree to which improvement of these conditions might prevent further escalation. Now, I don't know that those conditions have improved. But. I, I don't think we have any way of knowing that they've improved one way or the other. Uh, my understanding is that they really haven't. There's been a lot of, a lot of uh, visibility uh, t uh, to this particular issue. The North Korean human rights record is absolutely atrocious. You have something like estimates between maybe two million to as low, I mean, two million is the high end. The North Koreans say something like maybe 250,000 people died because of starvation during the 1990s. You have something like 200,000 to around 200,000 of people who are in sort of political uh, work camps, which are under incredible conditions, uh, atrocious conditions. So the human rights record in, in North Korea has been documented as best it can uh, through a, a number of sources, and it's something that uh, I think there will be an accounting of some kind, not only for those people who are in North Korea at some point uh, when things do change, but quite frankly, I think as me as a Korean American, but I also think all of us as humanity, of all humanity, are going to have to come account for some of the things that have happened there. Um, is there something that we can do about it? I, I think that uh, the government has limited efforts to be able to do what's going on. There are priorities here, but I think all of us as individuals have a responsibility uh, to keep the pressure on our policymakers and, and North Koreans to be accountable for what's going on. That's not to say that we're going to make a difference over the short term, uh, but it's something that we have to make sure is not forgotten and, and do the best we can. I, I think the human rights situation in North Korea has long been horrible. 
uh, and is probably marginally worse uh, in the past year under Kim Jong-un. There are reports that it's uh, harder to cross into China and, and things like that. Uh, the human rights situation is, of course, a terrible situation in its own right, but it's, uh, it's also a symptom of the broader problem. If the North Korean regime were more successful and had not lied to its people so much, it would not feel the necessity of putting people in, in prison camps and concentration camps. So yes, indeed, if, if someday the North Koreans feel they no longer have to do that, that will be an indication that the regime itself is changing, is becoming more humane, more confident, and that will also uh, presumably make it easier to deal with these other security issues as well. The survival of a regime like North Korea is pretty rare these days, certainly not happening in Eastern Europe or the former Soviet Union. It's certainly not happening any longer in a number of Middle Eastern countries. Cuba is on the verge of you know, a non-Castro family leadership and so on. What is the prospect for a Prague Spring, an Arab Spring, inside of North Korea? Personally, I, I wouldn't count on it for a very, very long time. <laughs> right, I'm sorry to say, and I wish, uh, unless, um, there is, you know, the one way that would happen, and I think the regime is deathly afraid of this, is that's why they don't want to open up. I think if uh, one way of going about doing this, and I think some approaches that a number of policymakers were trying to uh, implement was, you take what North Korea gives you, there are cracks in the wall, and you try to go in, and you basically go to those cracks, and you try to make them as big as you possibly can. I mean, that is sort of the, the basis of what Kim, um, Kim Dae-jung was talking about in terms of his sunshine policy. I think in the implementation, there were cer certain flaws related to that, but that was, ba that was the idea. It was the idea that if you take a crack and you open it and make it bigger and bigger, that somehow, some way, the human spirit would find a way to, to, to implement change. And I think that there are, not, there are arguments among academics as well that talk about that particular kind of engagement as really one of, the, one of the only realistic ways for us to deal with the situation in North Korea at this point in time. And I, again, it's just echoed in another question here. So how do we get the tools, resources, technology, et cetera, to, to them to enable the citizens to collapse the regime from within? Have the citizens who would lead this revolution seen Gangnam style on their internet enabled devices, which they don't have. Uh, what is the plan that's actually going to work? So I'll just leave that. I think you've already answered the question, but that's a question that I come back to a lot. It's, this is an era in which being totally cut off from realistic visions of your own society in relation to other economies and other societies is very rare. And could, could I yes, add 30 absolutely. seconds? I, I agree with what Phil has said, but I think <clears throat> North Korea is very different than the countries of Eastern Europe, much more isolated geographically and historically, but they're human beings just like you and me and, basic, and operate in the same basic ways. And what's happening now is fascinating yep. because because Ch South Korea and the US are not giving North Korea what they want, they have been forced to rely on China. And they're learning about the, not just China, but the outside world writ large through the Chinese. And they are watching Gangnam Style on thumb drives and DVDs and CDs that they're getting uh, uh, via China. And this is very commonly watched now among the elite kids in Pyongyang. So I'm, I, I agree with Phil. I'm not predicting an, uh, an Arab Spring in North Korea in, in the next few years at least, and probably longer than that, I'm afraid. But it's eventually there will be change in North Korea as well. So two photos that we saw from a presentation that I think David, you and I were at that struck me. One was a photo of a young man down a subway. He had his hat on backwards, and there was a Nike swoosh. So that was one thing. <laughs> Second thing was a young person with a cell phone. And so those are the, the, the things, those are reasons for, for hope. Uh, but I don't want to be unrealistic or too idealistic that anything is going to happen anytime soon. Sir. Yes, I'm wondering to what degree um, you both think that this recent saber rattling has been a means to distract the Korean populace or North Korean populace 
and also the political class in North Korea from the failure of Juche economics? Yeah, I, I think David alluded to that uh, earlier. I think there's a huge domestic component to, to what's happening here. I think Kim Jong-un is young. He's about 30 years old. North Korea is a Confucian society which respects age. There is some work that he has to do to gain some credibility within the, in the society. And I think that what is happening here is part of that effort to brandish his credentials. I also think to the extent that you are trying to consolidate power, what better way to do that than to put the whole country on, on war footing? And so therefore, I, I believe that there is definitely uh, this domestic component here that goes into the thinking of, of what's happening here. I also think there's some speculation. Again, if you, you subscribe, if you subscribe to the theory that what's happening here is North Korea is ratcheting up pressure and has the ability to dial it down. And I, like I said, they do have some of that ability. What's happening here is you have what, what may happen, uh, these, game war, these exercises between the, uh, South Korea and the United States are going to be ending at the end of April. Uh, what could very well happen is no war or altercation breaks out, and Kim Jong-un can declare victory and say, I prevented all of this. So, and then what are the people going to say? They, he, he sort of goes through his, his, his trial of fire and comes out smelling like a rose uh, and, and then can move forward. Sir? Good evening. Uh, a lot of this conversation parallels what's going on in Israel and Iran. So if you just change the names, you're having the same conversation. Uh, it seems to me that... Uh, if you have a large family, a couple of them usually end up being spoiled brats and break things to draw attention to themselves. And that seems to me exactly what's going on here because you have actually with this 30-year-old and rather infantile mentality, his exposure, life exposure is very minimal. Why we continually pay so much attention to this situation concerns me. To Barack Obama's credit, he is rather pulling back from Israel and Iran confrontation, and I hope that he handles this one the same way and let these folks calm down and get a life. I'd like to hear your comments on that. Well, I, I have always been opposed to actions that might tend to uh, cause war on the Korean Peninsula. Um, and in fact, if you look at the behavior of the U.S. government, over the past 20 or 30 years since the nuclear issue with North Korea arose, the United States has talked the most about the nuclear issue and denuclearizing North Korea, but in fact, the U.S.'s primary priority has been the security of our ally, South Korea. And that certainly must have been a powerful reason for the United States never to take preemptive action, uh, military action against North Korea's nuclear facilities. Um, so, as I said, I, I suspect that North Korea will continue on its current trajectory. Uh, and I, I take what I think is the practical approach to this and what I think and hope will be the U.S. government's approach, which is we're going to preserve peace on the Korean Peninsula while remaining true to our principles, including the protection of our ally and global nonproliferation. And I think we can accomplish that and while managing the situation, eventually North Korea's government's attitude will change, or the government itself will change, or the government will collapse. There will be an opening for us to resolve this problem in the meantime without not having a war on the Korean Peninsula. So this is an interesting question. If North Korea achieves operational nuclear weapons capability, how will that affect prospects for Korean reunification? Would the U.S. accept a unified Korea as a nuclear weapon state? And I guess I would sort of add to this question, as North Korea moves in this direction, what will be the South Korean response? Because obviously reunification under a North Korean nuclear uh, governance would not be of interest to South Korea. Will it provoke? a South Korean nuclear weapons program. South Korea is a technologically advanced society. It has most of the capability to make nuclear weapons. All it has to do is organize the expertise and the technology to do it. Let me take the second question first. I think already you are seeing, and I think it's 
somewhat a natural reaction, but uh, in, in South Korea, that the South Koreans need to have a nuclear weapon of their own. There's a lot of discussions going on that are related to this that have to do with long-range missiles. Uh, North Korea, South Korea had limits on what kind of missiles it could use, and there was a recent agreement between the United States and uh, South Korea to extend that range all the way to, to North Korea, which previously would have been um, a violation or a, 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 that to, um, to uh, cancel out a limitation that had existed on that. I think for right now, that was one of the reasons why we were con people are concerned about a nuclear North Korea because of the nuclear cascade. It's the idea that uh, not only South Korea, then Japan, then you've got Taiwan, then, then China suddenly realizes we, they have to have no more nuclear weapons. For me, sitting as the director of, uh, executive director of Plowshares, that's something we definitely do not want. Uh, and from a security standpoint, I think that right now, I think it's a little bit too early for South Korea to say this is something that you actually need. Uh, the whole concept of deterrence exists on the peninsula. I think this is part of the reason why the United States response has been so robust and appropriately so, because it's to reassure not only the South Korea, but also the Japanese that extended deterrence is, is working. And so therefore, I don't think that right now, uh, I can't see any reason for why South Korea needs uh, uh, a, a, a nuclear, nuclear weapon or a nuclear capability at this point in time. Um, I can't remember. What the, the, the second question was, uh, if Korea is unified, and uh, right. will, will unified Korea keep nuclear weapons, uh, assuming North Korea con uh, continues to keep them? Um, well, that's very hard to answer something that is so hypothetical. At the present time, unification is certainly not in prospect. Um, and uh, I think that if the United States remains an ally of, of South Korea, and I assume that if unification occurs, it will be on South Korean terms, that is, a democracy, then the United States will continue to insist that our ally not have nuclear weapons. And if North Korea there has still left some behind, that is, with Ukraine and other countries, we will work with them to get rid of those weapons and materials as expeditiously as possible. So let me also answer that question in this way. I think that conspiracy theorists, uh, wherever you happen to be, will say that secretly South Korea wants North Korea to have these nuclear weapons because they think that reunification is going to happen and therefore they will have that capability. I, again, knowing that you can't tell what the hypotheticals are going to be, what the actual circumstances are going to be, I feel that's a pretty foolish policy. I think that if you allow that to happen, chances are that any kind of unification is going to be incredibly messy. And so what you have then under that, under a collapse scenario, or which it may very well be, or you know, a conflict or something happening, you have this problem of what we call loose nukes, is what I think is really the big medium to long-term problem. And it's the notion that when you have all this nuclear material that's being produced, it has, plutonium has a half-life of something like 22,000 years. Once that material is produced, you can't simply throw it away. It has to go somewhere, and it has to be secured. And so if you say, OK, North Korea, go ahead and produce that stuff. We're going we're gonna to use it later on. You have all that material out there. There are a lot of people in this world who want to do us a lot of harm, who would pay a lot of money for that material. And so for us and anyone else to allow that to happen, I think, is taking a huge chance that from a security standpoint, me, I, that's what really makes me worried. That makes me worried as a former policymaker. It makes me worried as the executive director of Plowshares. That's what I am worried about more than anything else. Sir, back there. Can you do it again in the mic? Sir, can we borrow that mic for a second? Sorry about that. Is there significant sentiment in South Korea for unification? And if so, why? You know, it's a very interesting and a very important question. When I first went to South Korea as a young uh, foreign service officer in 1979, every South Korean I met would say, we must have unification. You know, it had only been a generation since the, the, the peninsula was divided and the Korean War occurred. And Koreans looked upon that as the most natural thing in the world. 
uh, and as a panacea for all of the problems of the people of South Korea. It is stunning how different the attitudes today are in South Korea, especially among the younger generation. After the unification of Germany, there was sort of a national discussion in South Korea about that experience, and the bottom line was, my goodness, that was really expensive, and Germany was so wealthy. So many, many South Koreans genuinely began to worry about the tremendous burden this could be fiscally and financially upon their government and themselves. And there was, that helped to support Kim Dae-jung's sunshine policy, which was predicated upon a long process of convergence. Um, in addition, there is a great concern in South Korea among sophisticated people about how will we reunite two people, a, a, a single people who have been so uh, it, it raised, brought up so differently. Uh, the cultures now are very, very different. And the few, couple of 10,000 North Korean defectors in South Korea these days, most of them have a terrible time adjusting to this very go-go society, a capitalist society in uh, South Korea. So there is a substantial portion of South Koreans today who will frankly tell you, we don't want unification to occur anytime soon, and a smaller number who will say, we really are not interested in it. This gentleman has been very patient, and we're <laughs> nearing our last question, so we'll let you have the last question. May <clears throat> Maybe you saw that a hacker hacked the uh, North Korean website, I think it was Twitter, put a uh, picture of a pig on there, and uh, that was supposed to be uh, Kim Il-un. Uh, he, but another hacker also put something kind of provocative. He said, it's okay to be retarded, but don't be a total retard. So the idea is, have they pushed the envelope so far now that if one of their objectives is to get grain, to get aid, to get concession, that no American politician would be able to give them a reward for what they've done. Their brand is so bad in American public opinion that they might be isolated for the foreseeable future. Uh, well, I, I think that your read of American politics is absolutely correct. I think it's gonna make it, this is gonna make it very difficult for the United States to really move in, in any fashion anytime soon. And that's why I'm hoping to, to some respect that this escalation that is happening de-escalates very quickly and then we sort of get on to the business of trying to really figure out what our, you know, knowing what our interests are, how do we actually execute and implement that. I think to some degree what you're talking about, what I was talking about in terms of benefits, was really as much directed at South Korea. And what I found really interesting about the new president, Park Geun-hye, who is, was recently elected, she is said, in addition to her robust responses that she has talked about, she also talked about the ability to give humanitarian aid and to have discussions related to that, which I thought was a very nuanced way of going about it. Now, depending on how much more North Korea escalates and the kinds of things that they're doing, again, she's going to be under increasing pressure related to that. But I think that her, her credentials are beyond question in terms of um, how she views North Korea and sort of what her previous positions are. So the, sh the short answer is it's going to affect definitely what we can do here, and rightly so. Uh, and depending on how far North Korea pushes, I don't think they've gotten that far yet. Uh, that's my read, especially for South Korea, but we'll, ha we'll have to see. So I'm going to ask our panelists one last question and ask for a very short answer. If you could name one thing the U.S. should not do in order to not worsen the situation, provoke a war on the Korean Peninsula, what would that one thing be? We should not engage in preemptive military action uh, against a missile silo or a nuclear facility unless we're absolutely convinced that it is really going to be used and soon to attack us or our allies? I would think that the, the thing we should absolutely not do, again, is do a repeat of the B-52 bombers, uh, the F-22s at this point, I think, uh, and the, what is it, the uh, B-52 
B2 stealth, B2 stealth bombers. I think it was quite effective uh, and made a point, but I think the point has been made. Well, you both have given us some very good insight into the situation in North Korea and South Korea, the nuclear situation. So we appreciate your comments. Uh, David Straub, uh, Associate Director of the Korean Studies Program at the Stanford uh, Asia Pacific Research Center. Phil Yun, my friend and colleague, Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of Plowshares Fund. We'd like to thank you here in the room in San Francisco at this town hall meeting, our audiences on radio, television, and the internet. You really make a town hall meeting work. We'll do this again uh, before long. I know there were a lot of questions we didn't get to, but for now, thank you. Uh, and this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, where you are in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>